Now we come back to the uh, this issue of cosmology. We know very well that these theories were formulated, perfected, and so on before we knew about the extent of the cosmos, the amount of matter in the cosmos, and so on. So after 1930, after Edwin Hubble's uh, uh, observation that there are a lot of extragalactic objects which seems to be going away from us at a velocity proportional to their distance, people started looking at uh, galaxies outside, far away, using the new generation of large telescopes, one meter telescope, Palomar, and various other places. Then slowly, we realized that the universe was at least a thousand times larger than what we thought it is. Okay, we knew this Milky Way and a few nebulae around this Magellanic clouds and so on. But with these new telescopes, we realized that the universe is at least thousand times larger. If it is thousand times larger, of course the volume is a billion times larger, cube of this thousand. So if the volume is billion times larger, we also expect the matter in this universe also a billion times larger than what we thought it was. All that is fine. But now, if there is so much matter, there has to be corresponding amount of gravity. And gravity is a very special interaction because it can affect clocks, it can affect propagation of objects, it, it can affect all dynamics. Even Einstein's theory itself, the general theory of relativity, which is a theory of gravity, also says these things. We already know from exper experiments that if you have two clocks at two different gravitational potentials, one at a lower potential, another at a higher a distance, a different potential, these two clocks will run at different rates, depending on the value of the potential at the local location of the clocks. So there is gravitational time dilation. And there is a difference in potent, gravitational potential. It can affect the rate at which the clock runs. However, such effects are not included in, a, in the present theories in the sense with this enormous gravity in this universe, with this enormous gravitational potentials, if there is any effect on clocks and propagation of light and so on, those effects are not part of our current theories because in the current theories, the you know, matter in the universe is not even considered. So there is a very big, uh, big missing factor. Of course, we don't know a priori that this gravity has a significant effect or not, that we have to calculate. But the fact that gravity affects everything means we need to reconsider our theories. That because we have this new information about the universe, and if the gravity has any importance, if, it, if its magnitude is sufficient to affect phenomena in the laboratory, we have to reconsider these theories and uh, calculate all these effects and see whether this is significant to change the theories or not. That's the basic premise. Now this calculation can be done and some very interesting, uh, very interesting facts come out when you do a, even a rough calculation. See today, Cosmology has developed to a stage where, where we have a, a reasonably good idea about the average density of matter and energy in the universe. Okay. So we have direct observation of galaxies and uh, various sources which emit light. But that is not all the matter. There is uh, what is called dark matter, for example. They are indirectly measured using 
their gravitational effects. So the, we have a we have some measurements of this average density of the universe. There is some uncertainty, both conceptual and quantitative uncertainty in all these measurements. But if you have a reasonable idea how much matter is there, how much energy is there, and so on in the universe today. If you use these observational values and calculate the total gravitational potential in our rooms, for example, in your room or in the room I am sitting, the same value because the universe has the same kind of appearance relative to our small Earth. The number which comes out is a very interesting number. The total gravitational potential due to all the matter in the universe, all the matter and energy in the universe, if you calculate, you get a number which is numerically very, very much, uh, very close to the square of the velocity of light. That's velocity of light is 300,000 kilometer per second. Take the square of that. That's a number. That number matches the value of the total gravitational potential of the, all the matter and then energy in the universe. So this is not a coincidence. There is something profound in the fact that these two numbers match. First suggestion is the propagation of light is controlled by the gravity of the matter in the universe. That is why there is a relation between the velocity of light and the gravitational potential of all the matter and energy in the universe. The cosmic gravity, its value, is equal to the square of the velocity of light. Okay. So, not only that it is enormous, enormous gravity, it's also this particular value I talked about. This can be calculated. This fact was known for a long time. People did not connect it up with anything else. But this fact was known for a long time. It's not a new fact. That is one thing. Now, referring back to Marx's principle. See, why did what Marx said was very profound. Everybody agrees that what Marx said and what is called Marx principle today. It was named Marx principle by Einstein himself. Even Einstein said it is a very profound principle. But you all know that Marx principle is not part of our standard physics today. Marx principle is talked about as an extraneous principle. It is not part of any standard theories of physics today. There is a reason for that. Which I, when I first re realized this, I was really amazed. Max principle implies that there is one universal frame, one universe. Because Max principle says uh, effects of dynamics, centrifugal force, and things like that happens because of some interaction with the rest of the matter in the universe. Whatever that interaction is, since universe is one reference frame, accepting Marx principle immediately implies accepting a absolute frame like ether and so on. But once you accept a absolute frame, the direct consequence is that propagation of light is Galilean. The velocity, relative velocity of light will depend on the velocity of the observer. So, the Max principle cannot be incorporated in current physics without breaking Einstein's theory, without throwing away Einstein's theory of relativity. So, because of this, though Einstein really, if you look at the history of the development of general theory of relativity, how Einstein developed that theory, for about five years, Einstein could not decide whether Max principle should be taken as a basis of general theory of relativity or some other principle. He tried incorporating Max principle into his theory of gravity, the general theory of relativity. He could not because general theory of relativity was based on special theory of relativity, in which he already assumed the invariance of the velocity of light. 
But Marx principle needs an absolute frame, which will deny the basic postulate of special theory of relativity. Therefore, he finally discarded Marx principle. That is why Marx principle is not anymore uh, discussed in physics. So anyway, so the the interaction, gravitational in, interaction with all the matter in the universe provides this gravitational potential affecting everything in the universe. So if you take two clocks, one clock which is stationary in this universe and another clock which is moving in this universe, the gravitational potential experienced by the moving clock is slightly different from gravitational potential experienced by the stationary clock. And this can be calculated. Since you know what is the gravitational potential for a stationary frame, which is, I said, uh, the score of the velocity of light, you can very precisely calculate what is the gravitational potential felt by a clock which is moving. And then it turns out that the time dilation which we see, beyonds and uh, accelerators and so on, or moving real clocks in the laboratory, all the time uh, dilations which we see experimentally matches exactly with the gravitational effect of the universe. So therefore, we have an explanation of explanation for phenomena like uh, time dilation, which is a prime effect which of relativity 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 uh, we see in the laboratory. Laboratory evidence for relativity is prime example is time dilation. We know that you don't need Einstein's theory to explain that. We need only the gravity of the universe. Similarly, for many, many physical effects in the, uh, in the laboratory, we can do this calculation. The effect of the gravity of the cosmos, cosmic matter on what we see in the laboratory. And for every instance, without any exception, it matches. The calculation matches what we see in the laboratory. So every relativistic effect which we see in the laboratory today can be explained as a consequence of the gravity of the matter in the universe. I mean, that's a very, very profound framing of the interrelation of the cosmos and the effect yes. that the distant stars have upon us. Yes. It's a formulation that's been around since Mach's time, which he was writing in the 1920s? I think like 1800s. Yeah, 1870, 1880s. Right, because Einstein, Einstein was familiar with it. And so yes. it, it, it fell out of favor because relativity offers these very tantalizing thought experiments and purports to put us into a, personally, I think, a more fantastical universe. Yes. And so now we're up against the challenge where you have two theories where the mathematics give you, they can describe the same observed phenomena. Here the mathematics is different. The mathematics is different, but the, the end point is that you, you have an observation and you yes. can use one set of mathematics, which is Einsteinian relativity, to describe it. And then you have another set of mathematics, which refers to the cosmos to describe it. But yes. the observation is, is the same. And so yeah. th this comes down to preference and, and belief, really. Like this is a cultural no, state here there of is affairs. No choice. Here there is no choice. Okay, explain. Okay, because we can see the objects in the universe with a telescope, mm. you or various measurements related. So there are galaxies and so on. They are really there. They are not an illusion. If those gravities, if those objects are there, there has to be gravity of corresponding to those objects. There is no choice, mm. right? So, if gravity is there, those gravitational effects would be there. So now, if Einstein was, if, suppose Einstein's theory is right, then you will have double the effects. One due to Einstein's formulation, whatever that is, 
and this gravitational effect which has which has to be there because there is the also objects are really there but you cannot have both together mm. because that will have double the effect so you have to make a choice between one one between the two and the choice is obvious because those objects are there you cannot choose einstein's theory and say though those objects are there their gravity is not real you cannot make 